what factors made alcoholism hereditary. Because it does seem to have a strong hereditary component. And what we basically concluded after doing a tremendous amount of research was that people who are prone to alcoholism, at least one type of person who's prone to one type of alcoholism, got a very, very powerful stimulant effect from the alcohol during the time that their blood alcohol level was ascending in the 10 or 15 minutes after they took a drink, especially if they took a large drink fast or multiple large drinks fast. You can probably tell, by the way, if you're one of these people, if you want to go do this in the bar the next time you go, go on an empty stomach, take your pulse, write it down, drink three or four shots fast, wait 10 minutes, take your pulse again. If it's gone up 10 or 15 beats a minute, look out. Because that means alcohol is working as a psychomotor stimulant for you. And we found that for many of these people, that was an opiate effect. What seemed to happen was that when they drank alcohol fast, they produced probably beta endorphin, although we were never sure. We can, it can be blocked with naltrexone, which is an opiate antagonist. Anyways, the other characteristic of that pattern of, of, of alcohol consumption is that the, the real kick only occurs when you're on the ascending limb of the blood alcohol curve. So, you know, first of all, your blood alcohol goes up, and then it goes down. And generally, when it goes down, it's not pleasant. That's when you start to feel hungover. And a hangover is actually alcohol withdrawal, by the way. So it's like heroin withdrawal, except it's alcohol withdrawal. And it's generally not pleasant for people, so they usually sleep through it, or it puts them to sleep. But if you're one of these people who get a real kick on the ascending limb of the blood alcohol curve, then you can just keep pounding back the alcohol, and it'll keep hitting you and keep you in that position where you're you know, on, the, on the ascending part of the blood alcohol curve. And you can probably tell if you're one of these people if you can't stop once you get started. You know, so if it's like you have four drinks quick, and it's like, man, you're gone until the alcohol runs out or until it's four in the morning or until you've spent all your money or you've been at the last bar in town or that you're sitting on your friend's bed after everybody's gone home from the party and you're still drinking, you might suspect that you're one of those people. And if you are one of those people, well then, you should watch the hell out because um, alcohol is a vicious drug and it, it gets people in its grasp hard and it's hard for them to escape once they do. People also drink to quell anxiety. So now the problem... Because we were looking at the genetics of alcoholism, it wasn't easy to study offspring of alcoholic mothers. And the reason for that is they might have consumed alcohol during pregnancy. In which case, and that's a bad idea, especially there's certain key times in pregnancy where even a few drinks are not good. And that turns out, if I remember correctly, that turns out to be the times when the fetus is producing the bulk of its hippocampal tissue. And so, Anyway, so if it turned out that daughters or sons of female alcoholics were markedly different from the general population in some manner, we wouldn't be able to tell if that was a consequence of alcohol consumption during pregnancy or if it was, it was a genetic reflection. So what we wanted to do was study sons of male alcoholics. And so their mothers actually couldn't be alcoholic. And we wanted their fathers the best subjects had an alcoholic father and an alcoholic grandfather and at least one or more alcoholic first or second degree male relatives. And they couldn't be alcoholic and they had to be young. So because obviously if they were 40 and they still weren't alcoholic, then they probably weren't going to be alcoholic. So we wanted to catch them, you know, between say, well, it had to be 18, which was, it was in Quebec. That was even a little late, probably, but that, you know well, that's the best we could do from an ethical perspective. So we used to bring these guys into the lab and get them quite drunk. Um, the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse pretty much put a stop to that research because we used to bring them in and you know we'd get their blood alcohol level up to 0.12 or 0.10. It had to be pretty high. It actually looked like the real physiological effects seemed to kick in when, uh, when people hit legal intoxication. So you don't really get the opiate effect till you pop yourself up about 0.08, which was the legal limit for driving at that point. Um, so we used to get, some of these guys were pretty big. They'd come in, they were maybe 230-pound guys. And to get them up to, you know, 0.1 or 0.2, you had, or 0.12, you had to give them quite a, bit, quite a whack of alcohol. And then what we usually do is we let them sober up till 0.06, about that, and then we'd send them home in a cab. 
Well, when the NIAAA got all ethical on the whole situation, they wouldn't let us send them home until they hit 0.02. It was like, well, if you're 240 pounds and we've just nailed you with enough alcohol so that your blood alcohol level hit 0.12, you're going to be sitting in our bloody lab bored to death, feeling horrible for like six hours or seven hours. And you'd be pretty damn irritated about it. It's like, it wasn't obvious how we were supposed to keep the people there. It's like, well, can I leave? No. I'm not paying you if you leave. It's like, that's going to produce real positive outcomes with, like, drunk people in the lab. That's going to work really well. Of course, then they'd never come back either because it was such a bloody awful experience. So I stopped doing that research partly because it became impossible. Anyways, we did find out a lot. We found out that there was this one particular pattern of, of alcohol. Um, you mentioned you talked about this mental process where people do the thing that's hard but less, but less hard but still hard to avoid facing the shadow. Yeah, that's actually yeah. a really productive way of procrastinating, although it comes with its own problems of rationalization. And so that reinforces certain circuits. Yes. And then you talk about it in a way that says that those can't go away, so you need to bring up the, the other inhibitory circuits. And I'm just wondering if you can elaborate. Well, I can. Sure. What is in the realm of possibility around their understanding of Well, I've, I've derived that partly from my study of addiction and also from my study of uh, recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder. But let's talk about addiction. So, there's a series of actions that occur before you take your cocaine. Some of those are local, they're the things that happen immediately before, and some of those are distal. They're farther back in the chain of events. And when you, when you have a hit of cocaine, it produces a dopaminergic burst, and that feels really good. But it also makes the circuits that were immediately active before that grow. That's what reinforcement is. And then the growth is proportionate, not linearly, but it's proportionate to how long before that event occurred. The closer it is, the stronger they're going to get. But even the ones that are somewhat distal get some reinforcement. Because you might say, well, what did you do before you, you found your latest fix? And the answer is, well, how long before? Well, the closer, the more rewarded. And so what happens then is that, so if you take that person out of the normal environment, you put them into a treatment center, they're off their physical addiction, which is a weird thing in the case of cocaine, but um, like not that long, a week will do it, two weeks for sure, even heroin. And, and alcohol, for sure, if you can get them through the seizure part without dying. Um, and so they're done. They're, they aren't physiologically dependent anymore. But you let that person go, and the first thing that happens is his old friend, who he's always out doing drugs with, shows up, and bang, he's craving like mad. And that's because that thing is in there is not dead at all. And it's, it's activated by the cue. And it's a, it's a circuit. It, it's not. It's a personality. It only wants one thing. It wants cocaine. It's going to suppress any non-related thoughts, and it'll use lies. That's no problem, especially if lies have been reinforced, which they certainly have. Where are you off to, son? You know, you'll have a lie for that, and then ten minutes later you have your drug, and so that little lie has just grown. Or maybe you think you've tried to quit, and you think to hell with it, and every time Ten minutes before you take your drug, you think to hell with it, and you do that a thousand times. Well, believe me, the to hell with it circuit, that sucker is strong. And so, it's alive, and it's not like it just disappears. You, it can't. It's you. It's grown in there. Now, you can build another circuit to shut it down, and you can help it decompose across time by not giving it what it wants. But you're going to have to not give it what it wants in all of the multiple contexts that you've already associated with the drug. Some of you have probably smoked and then tried to quit smoking, and what you'll see is you get a craving when, well, when you have a cup of coffee, or when you're finished dinner, or when you're done having a phone call, or when you first get up in the morning, or whenever you've regularly had the drug, whatever you had the drug in relationship to, even complex things like ending a conversation will produce a cued craving. And so then that can extinguish over time if you punish it by either punishing it or not letting it get what it wants. But a lot you have to build another circuit to just shut it down. And then that circuit's kind of fragile and stress can often disrupt it. So That can be mediated by some of the books that people read about quitting smoking or things like ibogaine. And oh sure, well part of that, well ibogaine's a, a, a whole different thing because it seems to have a direct physiological effect. But, you know, the 
the, the addiction has a cognitive component. It's full of thoughts and desires and wants. And you know, you may have to build a, you may have to rebuild your whole personality in order to, to get that thing cornered. Religious conversion, for example, is a really effective treatment for alcoholism. That's partly why alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous works for the people for whom it does work. But religious conversion, which is total personality conversion, is actually one of the few things that we know of that's an effective treatment for alcoholism. We don't know how to induce it, but although that's not exactly true either, because um, in the early work with LSD was LSD was quite promising as a treatment for al for alcohol addiction, and there's recent work with psilocybin showing that if you if people have a mystical experience when you give them psilocybin, their success rate in quitting smoking is about 80 percent which is way higher than any pharmacological intervention for smoking has ever been. So, all right, we should probably call it a day.